Okay, hi everyone. Um, welcome and thank you for joining our particle panel series today. It's titled Particle Size, Data Interpretation and Communication. Particle panel series is a series of talks where we aim to answer your toughest unanswered questions by keeping it very practical. My name is Julie Chen Nguyen. Um, and I'll be interacting with you in the background. We'll have a Q&A session in the end. Okay, so let me introduce you our speaker today, Dr. Jeff Bodicombe. He is our product line manager for all things particle. What that really means is when someone doesn't know something, um, Jeff comes in. <laughs> so we're very lucky to have him today. All right, Jeff, <laughs> I'm gonna pass the ball to you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. All right, well, I'm talking about uh, com interpreting and communicating particle size data and size distribution data. And and this is kind of one of these topics that when you first look at it, say, well, this, you know, it's a bunch of terms and, and, it, um, and it turns out to be very important because that's really how you're going to communicate with your colleagues, customers, and suppliers about what you have to offer or what you need or what's going on. Uh, so using the same terms or agreeing on definitions makes that a whole lot easier. Uh, this is my normal chart of analysis techniques. Uh, and we offer a range of them. I plot diameter on the bottom and resolution mixtures on the left. This, this talk really applies to all of the techniques uh, th that Hariba offers for size characterization. Uh, so everything from nanoparticle tracking at the very fine end down and DLS down the nanometer range up to what's happening at the millimeter size range that you would analyze typically by image analysis. So let's start with kind of size terminology. Most often we talk about particle sizes, we're gonna talk about sizes in the range of microns, uh, which is uh, uh, when you get very, very small, so one millionth of a meter, as you get much smaller, uh, you go down to the nanometer size range, which comes up in nanoparticles. And as you go to the large particles, you might see millimeters used to express particle size. But microns comes up most often. Uh, I, when I talk about this, I always like to throw in that a beard second is the a unit of length, kind of a fun unit of length, which is uh, 10 nanometers. And so if, if you want to have fun at parties, you tell people you describe your work in terms of beard seconds, which is how the distance to your beard, an average beard grows in a second. Another set of expressions uh, for particle size really comes from the use of sieving, which I will mention um, in a few minutes. Uh, so on the left, I make a table with microns and then uh, two different sieve sizes, uh, US mesh and, and uh, Tyler mesh. And as uh, basically just the thing to keep in mind is first, if you're working between uh, kind of linear dimensions such as microns or millimeters and, and, me and mesh sizes, so you know, you know, a table is an awfully handy thing to have. Uh, the, the second is that as your, as your particle size goes down, your mesh goes up. So you can see that uh, uh, 4.7 millimeters is a four mesh. And when I go down to 63 microns, that's a 400 mesh. And so it's, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, as I go down, six, uh, sorry, that's 250 meshes, 63 microns. So really just this inverse relationship, it's kind of like wire gauge sizes. And that's the take home from this, uh, we, we have a little table that we hand out. You can find these online. Uh, well, keep in mind that there are different mesh size series. I have US and Tyler here, there's ISO as well. So next question is kind of if you have a particle, and I have a picture of a particle on the left here, what's the most meaningful particle size? Well, if I'm working from a picture, I, I could start talking about the particle width uh, XC min for a microscopist, or the area, projected area of the particle expressed as X area, or the longest length, uh, say a Ferre max. And 
one approach to this whole question is, well, what size makes the most sense or is the most important for my process? And then you'll start looking at these sorts of measures. Different size definitions will give you different results. So uh, the Faraday max on this might be four microns and the width of this particle might be two microns. Well, neither expression is wrong. It's just looking at two different things. And so when you communicate about size results, you want to make sure that you are discussing the same size definition, because if you aren't, uh, you're just going to be talking past each other an awful lot of time. Kind of next concern as we talk about what size definitions to use is what size can you measure? Uh, size parameters that we measure are, are really kind of all a little bit odd. And, 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 and all that comes down to is economics and the effort required for measurement. Uh, so you, if you look at sieve analysis, you're really looking at the, at the size of a particle that fits through a grid. And so you have this, this square grid, and if you can bounce the particle around so it slides in, it's going to depend on really the width and the thickness of the particle and have no connection to the particle length. But that's what sieving is. It's kind of, uh, so when you talk about sieve sizes, that's one measure. If I jump to the other end of my particle analysis and I'm looking at nanoparticles, which are often too small to image with light, uh, we're gonna be looking at the size of a sphere that moves through the liquid like your particle. I'm really looking for the same viscous drag. This is the hydrodynamic diameter, and you will find that in your dynamic light scattering, your nanoparticle tracking analysis, and centrifugation measurements. And all three of these measurements have a uh, significant viscous drag term. Of course, in DLS and NTA, it shows up in the diffusion coefficient, and centrifugation is uh, viscous drag versus, uh, um, versus gravity or centrifugal force. In laser diffraction, what you report out is the size of a sphere that scatters like your particle. And, and, and so again, why would you try to match scattering patterns? Well, that's really the most economical way to make a, a nice repeatable measurement that tracks your process. Same applies to viscous drag and sieving. Uh, so a lot of definitions you find uh, up here, I have nice microscope pictures because this is a particle that's big enough to do it. A lot of time you have some compromise just in what your size definition is. And if you were to find a particle that worked for all three of these cases, you would get to different sizes out. And all three are correct. They're just different definitions. So now I've shown you one particle and I think I got through blew through about six different ways of saying how big is that one particle. Uh, just for fun, the vast, vast majority of practical samples are a mixture of many, many particle sizes together. And so we aren't really trying to talk about just what is the particle size. We're trying to talk about this, this distribution of sizes. So if you take something chemically pure like table salt, uh, you could say, well, I have salt. It's all sodium chloride but it's different particle sizes, uh, ranging from small to large in the same container. So we've gone from the problem of getting this one number to having a whole, whole bunch of numbers and deciding how to talk about them. And really to talk about them is how to summarize it. So you can display the, the results as a distribution. And so that's what's plotted in this graph here. I have the differential distribution on the left as a function of particle diameter. And notice I use the word diameter down here. Uh, this, most of the time when people are talking about particle size, they're talking about particle diameter. Sometimes people talk about radius, and this will come up uh, probably a little bit more often in uh, biological work and polymer work, but radius also appears so you wanna make sure I'm talking about diameters, not radii, kind of a first question, particularly if you and your, and your colleague have a two to one difference of opinion about size. Now next, you can see these black bars 
And this is really a histogram, and it's a nice way of showing the results of a size measurement, whether it's from sieving or dynamic light scattering and so on. And I'm really saying about 0.2 and change percent per nanometer of particles is between, oh, that's probably 20 and 40 nanometers. And then one point, almost 1.3% 1 change is between 40 and 60. Actually, that's 80 and 110 nanometers. And, and you can think about how many uh, particles are in each of these bins. You can draw a line through the center of the bins and use that to show your differential. And this is very helpful if you want to overlay the data because overlaying histograms really is difficult to read. The other option is the cumulative plot, and that's plotted in green against the right-hand axis. So rather than seeing this peak with, uh, in my distribution with most of the particles about 100 nanometers, I'm looking at this green line and saying I go from this amount of particles is less than this size, this amount of particles here is less than this size. All of these representations are showing the same underlying data about the distribution, but just different ways of looking at it. And which one do you use really depends on uh, a couple things. The first is what does your boss want or what does your customer want? Because you'd like to communicate the way they do. And then the second is what gives you the information you need. Uh, so here's an example of a uh, LA960, uh, various options for displaying size results. And here I just show the differential distribution as a line. I might show the differential and the cumulative, differentials against the left, cumulative against the right. And you can tell cumulative distribution because they start low and go up to 100% and stay flat and the differential are these peaks. We can show histogram, and the bottom right panel really shows why uh, I tend to shy away from histogram displays, uh, and, and that's when you go to overlay data, you can see the differences in distributions much more easily with uh, the cumulative distribution and the differential with the lines. You can say, oh, it's a little bit different between this point and this point. It's a little hard to see, but those two lines don't overlay exactly. And the, the differentials, you can see the differences a little bit more clearly. Okay, so when you have a cumulative distribution, interpreting it, if you're not used to them, can be a little, a little bit of a puzzle. It's kind of, if, if you're not familiar with them, just take a moment to walk through it mentally as you're looking at a data set. Here, I have that same data. The green line goes with the right axis. It starts at 0% and goes up towards 100%. And at this point here, it's still zero. That means none of the particles are smaller than 40 nanometers. This point here, 9.67% of the particles are smaller than 80 nanometers at this point here. Here, 64% of the particles are smaller than 120 nanometers. And if I, there's a point in between, I can say 40% of the particles are smaller than well, 105 nanometers. So that's, you can, that's how you interpret cumulative. You'll also notice that the slope of this line really corresponds to the height of the histogram bins. So we can't really go through life calling up our buddy and saying, well, look, I, I got the size distribution from you and it shows a peak and the peak sets uh, a little bit to the left of where it was last weekend, kind of tails off to the, well, you might say it kind of tails off to the right, but when you talk about peak positions, that's really the first way you're going to summarize your size distribution. Uh, and and I really, the term for this is a central value. And so most often you'll see these repeat, reported because that's a single number that describes the, the distribution location, if you will, on the X axis. A couple of ways to do it. The first is to take some sort of weighted average and report out a mean size. So in this case, uh, the, weighted, the mean number weight 
mean size is 144 nanometers. It's a little bit to the right of the peak because I have this long tail to the right on the distribution that kind of pulls the mean towards higher values. I might report out the median, which is the point where half the particles are larger and half the particles are smaller. And so the way I find the median is I go to my cumulative, find 50%, and then I look down and see what size comes out, which is 109 nanometers. The mode in the size distribution is really the bin with the largest population of particles, and that's at 100 nanometers. So that's a little bit of affected, well, it certainly is affected uh, by the width of the bins that you choose, you know, where the other values are interpolated, and so they, they are somewhat less sensitive to that. Okay, this, I want to talk about briefly Z average uh, from dynamic light scattering because that doesn't really fit in with a lot of the rest of this talk. And someone, when they registered, started mentioning this. So hopefully this starts to approach uh, this question. In dynamic light scattering, the way we extract out uh, the, the Z average size is a little bit, well, quite different from extracting a distribution first. And there's some numerical reasons that this is done. Um, but really, you can think about the Z average size determined by DLS as the intensity weighted harmonic mean size. Well, first, why is it a harmonic mean? That is one over the DZ is, well, you can see the equation. Uh, that's because we're really first calculating the mean um, diffusion coefficient, and diffusion coefficient is inversely related to uh, particle size, or hydrodynamic diameter, in fact. Uh, the, yeah, the second is this intensity weight. So typically, uh, dynamic light scattering has a strong intensity weight. The intensity weighting is, is significant and it's hard to get away from it. And so we just, uh, the way the math works out, we report out this intensity weighting. So that's the bad news. It's a little bit of a confusing concept uh, unless you dive into the scattering. The good news is as your size distribution goes up, so it's just the average size, and so everything kind of gets you through the day. But tying it back to a particular uh, binning is, is, is not really a practical thing. So that's kind of a quick aside for, for DLS work. So moving back to techniques like nanoparticle tracking analysis, like laser diffraction image analysis, we do have these histograms and then we do report, can have all sorts of options for reporting out mean sizes. Uh, the next after, or reporting out central values, the next thing I want to talk about are D values. So quite often some will say D50 is 109 nanometers. What does that mean? Well, that means half the particles are larger than 109 nanometers and half the particles are smaller. And so in the plot here, I show kind of how you would find a D50 value with the cumulative distribution, you find 50%, drop it down, 109 nanometers. If you want to look at what are the fine particles in distribution, you might look at D10, uh, which is uh, gonna say 10% of the particles are smaller than this value. So D10 at 81 nanometers says that 10% of my particles are smaller than 81. Well, if you want to look at what's large or how large your sample gets, you'll get a D90 value uh, saying, well, 90% of my particles are less than 269 nanometers. Now notice something else. When someone gives you D10, D50, D90, you can get a sense of the skew of the distribution because D10 is closer to D50 than D90. So D90 to D50 is about 150 nanometers and D10 to D50 is about uh, what, 30 nanometers. Uh, so there's a fair amount of information packed into those three numbers. Would you expect three numbers is more than uh, more than one or two? And you will also see various uh, D values reported. Uh, some people like to use D15, D85. Uh, some people will say, well, I want, um, D70, I 
or D5 if you really want to look at the fines and put up with a little bit more uncertainty. And so that's how you report, how you would interpret those numbers. Now I can also turn this around and say, you know what, I have a process. I want to make sure most of my particles are less than a particular size. Say it's a filtration process. I don't want to plug my filters or something. Well, then I can take my cumulative distribution, start at 200 nanometers, and then look to my right and say, well, 83% of particles are less than 200 nanometers. Or I may pick 100 nanometers, go up here, look to my right, 36% of my particles are less than 100 nanometers. And so if there's a particular size cutoff that you worry about uh, as you're using your particles, then you look, start looking for values of percent less than, uh, or, and, and then one, one minus that is just percent greater than. This is really devalue interpretation reversed. Okay, um, every so often people look at this uh, cumulative distribution and say, well, gee, 0% of my particles are less than 40 nanometers. And if I extend the axis out, I can say 100% of my particles are less than 9, 920 nanometers. So well, I just set my spec. I don't want any particles less than 40 nanometers. And if there is one, throw the whole thing away. Uh, the problem with that is that when you, when you ask for D0 or D100, you're really saying all the particles kind of in your parent uh, parent batch. So if we make an analysis and we say 0% of particles are small than 40 nanometers, what we're really saying is, well, obviously to within error, 0% of the particles in the analyzer are less than 40 nanometers. And it's really 0% of the particles that we, we look at, um, you know, say in an image analysis measurement, or 100% of the particles we look at are smaller than 920 nanometers. It doesn't really guarantee the same for the rest of the truck uh, from which you drew this sample. And that getting the right number out of your analyzer uh, out of a very large uh, batch is a whole question of sampling uh, that we've talked about before. So to really claim you have no particle or particular size, you have to measure all your particles. And that's generally not a very reasonable proposition. And so you want to set your specifications using, say, D10 or, and D90 at the extremes for most applications, just to keep yourself from making claims or requests that really can't even be checked. Uh, but, you know, even if you have the perfect process that meets these claims, uh, proving it is going to be a real challenge. So I talked about a measurement of central tendency, which is where the distribution is on the x-axis. The next is, what about width? Uh, I have a blue and a black size distribution. Notice that I use differential distributions and line graphs, so they're easy to overlay. Uh, and they're kind of in the same position, uh, but they have a different width, and that can be important uh, for various reasons. You might think about uh, stability in terms of Oswald ripening, for example that you want a narrow size distribution. Well, there are lots of ways to talk about width. Uh, one is to talk about the standard deviation, uh, which, and this is very much like calculating a standard deviation in statistics. Uh, so you square root of the variance, if you will, but rather than calculating the standard deviation of repeated measurements, you're calculating the standard deviation of your distribution of particles. Quick warning, if you're going to talk about standard deviation of your size distribution, and you're going to be making a measurement multiple times, invariably someone is going to start to wonder, are you talking about repeated measurements or just within a single measurement? If you kind of know this warning advance, uh, life is pretty good. If, if, if you lose track of that concept, uh, you can get confused. Another uh, way of expressing distribution width is the span, uh, D90 minus D10 over D50. So those are those D values. So I have D90 minus D10 divided by where D50 go over here, of 1.72. And this uh, standard deviation over mean of this is 0 0.72. Incidentally, if I could get closer with D85 minus D15 over D50. 
50. So span can be defined different ways. So when you're talking about span, make sure you're using the same definition. Because uh, somebody is using a different definition, it can lead to confusion. There is also a geometric standard deviation. If you look at this size distribution, you say, well, gee, that's not very Gaussian looking. It skews to the right. Uh, this is not uncommon. And so uh, you might use a uh, log normal distribution and then think about it in terms of geometric standard deviations, which I give the equation below. So we started by talking about where the different ways of expressing the position of the distribution. Now we talked about ways of expressing the width of the distribution. All of these numbers are right, and which one you choose depends a lot on what you can measure readily. Uh, you might use DLS and polydispersity index if you uh, and report uh, Z average diameter and polydispersity index if you have nanoparticles, for instance. Or you might uh, report span and and because that's the way your company has done it for 40 years and they made money that way and there's no reason to upset any apple carts. Uh, and both of those are completely valid reasons uh, to pick a particular parameter. And the key is make sure everybody's using the same one. As you plot out distributions, uh, this is, you can think about linear versus logarithmic x-axis. So I have the distribution density percent per nanometer. Um, on the left here, and a linear uh, axis, so you can see that how it looks. If I switch to a logarithmic x axis, uh, and I use the same number of bins for the si over that size range, uh, you're going to get a somewhat different looking peak, and you're also better able to look at what's happening out at large sizes because it kind of squishes everything together. Uh, and as your distribution gets broader, the temptation to use logarithmic uh, axes gets much stronger. And that, that's perfectly normal. I, I, ISO and the particle characterization community uh, use the equal areas convention in semi-log plots, and that's 9276-1. So we really plot DCD log X uh, in this. There, there are two ways to approach semi-log plots, and I'm just alerting you as to the convention. Uh, it's not explicitly discussed very often, so I thought I'd bring it up. I mentioned mean sizes, and uh, that 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 turns out to be a uh, uh, I guess I guess I should call it a cruel subject because we're talking about means and there are a lot of different ways to calculate it. So I have three spheres with diameters of one, two, and three units. And so what's the average size of these spheres? Well, I just one plus two plus three is somewhere around six divided by three. Oh, the number mean is two. And so that's one way of looking at it. But there are really a number of different ways of calculating a mean value. They all uh, have reasons, and um, you know they're all none of them are really wrong. They're just different techniques. So I calculated up by number at the top. I might decide, hey, I really want to know. Um, I'm really interested in mass, and so I want to make sure that my largest particles count most significantly. So I might take the diameter times the volume of the first particle plus diameter times the volume of the second, diameter times the volume of the third, divide by the volume of each of the particles to get a value of 2.72 rather than two. And this comes up very often as D43 or volume weighted mean. If you get formal about your means, there is a moment ratio expression from ISO 9276-2, which I just put here. I'm not gonna walk through it. Uh, because it's pretty boring. And next up, I just want to point out a couple of the common summations and a theme. So we talked about number mean is D10. So the diameter I first times the diameter to zero power times one plus diameter of second, diameter to zero power of that zero there plus diameter of the third, zero and one plus one plus one, and that gives me a number. Well, if I'm interested in surface areas, I might take the diameter of the first times the surface area of the first, diameter of the second times surface area of the second, that's the D squared, D3, 
and then sum up the surface areas to obtain D32 of salary. Finally, I might take the diameter of the first times the volume of the first, diameter of the second, volume of the second, and so on, divide by total volume system to get the volume mean size. Uh, so 3.2 is a, a volume surface mean or the salary mean. Uh, it's the diameter having the same of a particle having the same volume to surface area ratio as your as your population. And this is useful where the specific surface area is important, thinking of dialysis, dissolution, and bio bioavailability. Volume mean comes up a whole lot more, and that's well uh, the volume weight average size and tends to emphasize detection of large particles. These are, we put the, uh, these slides on the website and this whole webinar. So these are really some definitions uh, from our analyzer that are for your reference. A few more def definitions. I want to talk about number versus volume distributions for a few minutes, uh, because I think it's, it's an important idea and uh, once you get it, you can kind of fill in the middle for uh, for surface area. So if I have nine particles, radius of one versus two versus three microns, volume of four, volume of uh, 32, volume of 108, my number distribution is three and three and three, but my total volumes are going to be quite different. Uh, 2% here of the one microns, 22% of the two microns, and 75% of the three micron. And so when I convert from number to volume, you can see how the small particles kind of decrease the distribution and the large particles increase. Uh, that, that example I showed you gets a little awkward, kind of uh, hard to see, and uh, we have a better example I like anyway with beans, uh, lima beans, black beans, mung beans. So I can take uh, three graduated cylinders with equal volumes of beans. I have a double amount, I start counting, I find out the number of beans is quite different. So the smallest number are these large size beans and the largest number are the small size ones. If I take the equal number of each and put them in my graduated cylinders, you can see the small ones, this is the same number of each of them, but the effective volume or the volume of each size is quite different. And if you're interested in things like mass, uh, then this volume weighting is much more important to you than the number weighting. I took the distribution I've been talking about already and replotted it with number versus volume. So the blue is number weight distribution, and the red is the volume weight distribution. So see how different they look, that this peak kind of really gets crushed down as, and then these tiny amounts of larger particles start to become important in the distribution. That distribution really looks quite different. Uh, so the number mean goes from 145, the volume mean size is 475 nanometers, and D50 goes from DN50, because the N means number and V is volume, goes from 109 to 468. You can also see this in the cumulative distributions where I've gone from this black line, nice uh, steep slope corresponding to a sharp peak to this long gradual slope showing a broad size distribution as I go from number weighting to volume weighting. So really when you're talking about your results, you need to say, this is number weighted result, this is a volume weighted result. Volume weighting is generally the most common. And there's a little bit of fun comparing the two. Uh, this comes from an AICHE AICHE presentation back in 2003. Uh, and then some citations here. Uh, really question, that inspires this is does the mean match the process? Are you going to track your process using the mean value that you obtained? Well, if you're monitoring size reduction or size growth, 
milling agglomeration. They're very common industrial processes. Depends on which mean you use. Let's do a size reduction. Take uh, 10 1 micron particles and one 100 micron particle and roll the whole thing through two rollers. So we're going to crack the 100 micron and leave the 10 microns unmolested. So now I have 10 1 micron and two 80 micron particles due to conservation volume. So let's look at the number of means. 10 particles of size 1, 1 of size 100. So I have 10 times 1 plus 1 times 100 over 11. I get a number mean of about 10 units. Now, the largest particle just broke into two of 80. Okay, that's to con conserve volume. My number mean is 10 times one plus two times 80 over 12 is 14. So my number mean size has gone up by 40% by breaking the largest particles. So that's probably going to be kind of confusing to explain. Let's try the volume mean size, 10 of size 1, 1 of size 100. So that's 10 times 1 to the 4th plus 1 times 100 to the 4th divided by 10 times 1 cubed, the volume of the, of the uh, small ones, times 1, 1 times 100 cubed. So my volume mean size is one, just about 100. And that's because this term just gets so large. Now I break my largest particle into 2 uh, of 80. What happens? 10 times 1 to the 4th, 2 times 80 to the 4th, rather than 100 to the 4th, divided by total volume system, goes down to about 80 units. So I broke my biggest particle, and my volume mean size has dropped by 20%. Well, that's nice and easy to talk about. Okay, run this process, watch the volume mean go down until it hits the target. So kind of the problem is, Number mean goes up with breakage, volume mean can go down with breakage. Let's try growth and agglomeration process. Uh, so 10 1 micron particles with 10 46 micron particles. And these larger particles agglomerate to form a single 100 micron particle and 10 1 micron particle. Again, these numbers are picked to make the math easy and to conserve ma uh, mass. So with growth, 10 particles of size 1, 10 of size 46, number mean size is about 23. Makes sense. And then after growth, 10 times size 1 plus 1 times 100 over 11, the average size is 10. So oh wait, I went from 23 down to 10, even though I just watched half my particles get together to make a giant one. So that doesn't seem to be tracking things very well. Try volume means. Uh, the volume mean of the initial sample is 46.4, and the volume mean of the final sample is about 100. So now I've seen this, I've seen half my particles come together, and I've seen my mean size go from 46.4 up to 100. And so this shows the expected behavior. So you know everything makes sense. Just run this process till the size rises to where you expect it. Your quick summary of problem, number mean goes down with agglomeration and volume mean goes up with agglomeration, which makes us much happier. Just makes it easier to communicate with people if the numbers are moving in the direction they expect. So a couple practical implications. It's not just a party trick topic, um, although it's not a great party topic either, I'll tell you, just tell you that. You know, you can break particles, the mean will go up. Uh, I guess the exception is uh, if, you're, if you're in an if pre-meeting, the Fine Particle Research Institute, that is, that is a party discussion. Uh, yeah, more seriously, it's come up with a colleague of mine. I did an experiment, and I thought I broke particles, but the mean went up. Uh, so you should be aware this sort of thing can happen. And as you face questions like this, you might go back and say, well, let's look at the whole size distribution, not just the single numbers. And then decide what, you know, and so the distribution is doing what you expect. Uh, the parameters you use to summarize the distribution probably need to be adjusted so that they track what people like to talk about. Okay, I, I want to comment. Uh, do you only use volume? Well, volume is for good for processes I just mentioned. And so it does come up all the time. 
Some processes uh, are affected by small particles and numbers more valuable. Uh, so if you think about suspension viscosity, if you think, uh, or, or slurry viscosity, if you think about dust formation, uh, then you'll worry about number, number distributions. And then earlier I mentioned catalysis and dissolution as where surface area can be more important. It's generally easier to convert from number to volume than volume to number. And the reason for that is that with uh, the, uh, when you convert from volume distribution to number, you're dividing by the cube of diameter. And so you have to have very accurate diameter numbers in order to get good results out at the end because you wind up dividing by quite small numbers for your fine particles. You also, any errors on your fines in your volume distribution will tend to be magnified when you convert that to number. Going the other way from number to volume, not quite so, uh, not quite as much uncertainty. So a couple concluding comments, and the slide got a little bit busy. When you talk about particle analysis, how was it measured, what technique, what analyzer, uh, did, you, did somebody make the measurement? What parameter are you reporting? Is it me, median, mean, mode? What's the basis? Volume, uh, most common, number, surface area. And really you can have everything right and if you don't know what number they're telling you, you can, um, you can have an incorrect interpretation of what's going on. Here's a quick graph showing some like common measures. D50 uh, by volume, half smaller, half larger. Uh, D10, 10% of the particles are smaller, so that's gonna tell you about the fines. D90, it's gonna tell you about the larger particles in your system. Uh, please don't use D100 or Z0. Volume based, uh, volume means the sense of the larger particles and uh, surface area, the salary sal mean can be more sensitive to small particles. And inside that surface area mean is the size of a particle with the same surface or volume to surface ratio as all the particles in your system. So that's about it for. Well, <laughs> sorry. Thank that's you, Jeff. <laughs> I was like, for what? Well, for the excellent talk. Um, sorry to cut you off. I I do see a lot of questions that came in. So yep. may I jump in and start? Yes. And Okay, so can you discuss a little bit about um, bi or multimodal reporting? Yes, yes, I. Um, although I rambled on so long, I, I guess look at the time. I probably good. I didn't uh, uh, add this to talk. So uh, how do I want to do this? The um, I have only showed a single peak here, and uh, what. What you're going to um, find out is if you have two peaks, you're probably going to wind up talking about both of them. And kind of the worst case is if you have two peaks that have the same, roughly the same amount of particles, and your D50 is right between them, because that D50 is just not going to tell you anything useful. Uh, so for bimodal multimodal reporting, uh, you may find yourself reporting out the sizes of each mode, uh, or you may find your, uh, so that's one way to do it, or discussing the relative amount of each mode. Uh, so it's gonna depend a little bit on what's important. If you're, and also why you have that multimode appear as to what you talk about. But if you if you have a bimodal sample, uh, and and you need to get into a detailed discussion with someone, kind of the second words out of your mouth it, when they ask, hey, what's D50? Well, uh, my volume-based D50 is five microns, but it's bimodal, and I got one peak at one micron and one peak at, at 20 microns is a whole lot more helpful than just saying, it's, it's five microns, next question, please. So I hope that helps somewhat. Thank you. Um, what type of machine can quantitatively measure nanoparticles? So what technique can measure nanoparticles? Okay. 
Okay, so so you have options, and it depends on what you're trying to measure. Uh, I, 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 um, yeah, I just did a talk on this. So I, I uh, so laser diffraction can reach down to tens of nanometers, and is great when you have some large particles in your system, or you're tracking a large to small particle process. Um, dynamic light scattering is great for getting at the smallest particles, and um, so and not so good if you get over a micron or so due to settling. Uh, both of those report out size distributions, but don't report out concentration. If you need concentration analysis, or if you need higher resolution for small particle sizes, higher resolution distribution, you're really looking at nanoparticle tracking analysis as your tool. Uh, so, yeah, so each of the analyzers has its uh, strengths and weaknesses, depending on what you're trying to learn or quantitate about your nanoparticles. And your, your boss is going to mention this, so I will too. Question, price is always an issue. If you, uh, you know, if, if uh, yeah, yeah, so that sometimes you say, well, I only need to do, I only need to measure X. I only have X dollars and all works. And, um, you know, you don't want to spend extra. So, yeah, we can take this offline. Uh, we can talk about your application and, and see where it goes. Thank you. Where do you find the DI and VI values in the laser diffraction data? That depends on your analyzer. If you, uh, yeah, so I'm trying to think with the Hariba, you go to the results window and there's a tab you can go to and then you can export all those values. Uh, there's also, you can report out just in a regular pre report, five or, six, or your favorite 10, if you will. Uh, I, I probably one we should, yeah, if you have a Hariba, reach out to us and we can talk you through it. If you don't have a Hariba, you'll have to talk to your instrument manufacturer to, to tell you. And you can email us at labinfo at hariba.com. So I'm going to put that in the chat box so you can see it. Um, and the webinar that kind of discusses about uh, the nanoparticles and what techniques is most appropriate can be found on the website, which I included a link. And sorry, there was a little bit of typo there. Um, and for those of you who raise your hand, would you please type in your questions in the chat box so I can ask Jeff those questions. Okay, next, can you discuss the application of D43 and D32 and when to use what? Okay, so D43 is volume based, uh, and that is generally our default uh, for laser diffraction. One that's kind of easy to get out of the data without too much heartache, uh, and two, it tracks a staggering number of industrial processes. Uh, D32, uh, we're going to start looking at if you're particularly interested in the fines in your distribution. Uh, if you're particularly interested in surface area because you have a surface, a specific surface process, uh, catalysis, uh, dissolution, bioavailability, and the like. Uh, yeah, and then you know, volume weight, you're looking at agglomeration, you're looking at any sort of milling process, uh, any process that, where mass is important, say in the chemical reactions and so on, that's where your volume weight comes up. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, knowing the D50 of a sample, is there um, any specific relationship between the D98 and D50 that can be considered as an expectation for several samples of the same product? Uh, so, okay, so you have D50 and D98, so you really have two points in distribution. So you can imagine um, that, well, let's... Uh, I'm just going to pretend that your product is screened, uh, and and that, and so you could keep D50 the same. And if the screen breaks, D50 moves up slightly, but D98 jumps up a lot as a, as larger particles start to creep in. Okay, so uh, if you have a process where the largest and the smalls the, uh, both add to it, you can keep D50 exactly the same and have those tails move out and D98 will vary. Uh, so that's, yeah, so there's no 
reason to say, I know D50, and that's all I know, that D98 is going to follow. But if you say, I know D50, and I promised you that distribution is not going to change from sample to sample, then D98 will follow. Now, it's not, when you start making analyses, you're going to find out that no matter how much your process doesn't change, uh, D98 is going to be a lot less repeatable than D50. And that's because D98 kind of counts on that last 2% of the particles, whereas D50, you have lots of particles on each side. Uh, so it's that little teeny tail distribution that can be an analysis uh, challenge. And that is very heavily dependent on your sampling procedure. So you start thinking about sampling and riffling in that case. Uh, so yeah, there's no good expectation. I, I would as you're setting up your measurement, I would make repeated measures of both those parameters and see how repeatable the measurement is of the same sample. Um, particularly that D98, that kind of worries me a little bit. You want to make sure you know how repeatable those measurements are before you start saying, hey, my process is wandering. And then you'll go, yeah, so how repeatable are measurements? How repeatable is your sampling? And then you start looking at your process. So then that's going to be process by process. It's a very loaded topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But this one hopefully is a little bit simpler, but it's a mathematical equation. Um, one over DZ, and if we don't address this um, today, clearly we, we can certainly chat over um, the email, but yep. one over DZ equals um, sum of DI, DS divided by sum of DI. Does it reduce to DZ equals uh, sum of di, and I'm just uh, reading this out loud for our audience so we know what we're addressing. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, you know what? I wonder if there's a clever way to do this. Let's see. So the short answer is no, but it's a it's a question that's it's a subtle. Uh, uh, it's not. It's 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 a good question. So I want to go back and try and find a sum to show you. Ah, okay. So here are some sums. Um, it's not exactly the question you have, but you notice this is d cubed, this is d cubed by d squared, okay? So that, uh, I can't just cross out this d1 squared with this d1 squared at the bottom. I have to consider this entire sum on the bottom as a quantity, and it does not neatly divide out from this sum on the top. Uh, so that, yeah, so that's, uh, that, that's why that, that reduction is not going to work out for you. And, and and then yeah, yeah you got to really stare at, this, at the subscripts uh, to 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 tease that point out, which is why I, I want to zip over to an example for you. Yeah. Thank you, and I do want to honor your time. So let's take two more questions. Um, what is the accuracy if there are a few big particles, say 500 nanometers, and then a, a large number of smaller particles around 50 to 100 nanometers? What's the accuracy there? The accuracy on, okay, so um, it, that's going to be an accuracy on what? So let's, let's, uh, let's take, uh, yeah, 100 versus 500. Running laser diffraction, I could probably do an okay job with it. Um, if I run dynamic lights or nanoparticle tracking analysis, uh, I can do an okay job. With dynamic light scattering, if that number of 500 is too yeah, that the 500 nanometers is going to, if there are enough of them, it's going to push the average up. If there are too few, you won't, um, it'll change what's called the baseline in the calculations and you won't see it. Uh, so it is going to depend on, on, on the relative amounts of the two items. The way you want to approach that is start making up spiked samples to evaluate uh, what your analyzer can do. Thank you, and I think you discussed that too in the webinar called Fresh Insights into Nanoparticle Characterization, where Jeff compared DLS to fraction NTA. These are very commonly uh, heard questions. Okay, last, um, are there any special recommendations when working with nano emulsions? Yeah, so I guess one thing, uh, if, you're, if you're doing a, 
a milling process. I, that's a poor choice of words. If you're if you're if you're taking your if you're making a nano emulsion by starting with very large particles and using high shear or something similar to break them into smaller particles, then you'll want to analyze that tracks the process, and uh, you really want to go from. Um, uh, and so I'm a big fan of laser diffraction for that application because you can start with like five micron natural product particles, say squalane, mill it down and watch that large particle part of the distribution go down with each pass, say through a high shear analyzer. And I think that slides in the talk that Julie was talking, mentioning. On the other hand, if you're making a nano emulsion um, as droplets, uh, say in a latex polymerization, DLS has proven the tool of choice. So it depends a little bit on how it's made and, and, and where it goes next. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Anything else you want to add before we, uh, we wrap up? Uh, no, I think I'm good. I, I, um, yeah, I, I enjoyed it. Thanks for your time. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Um, don't hesitate to reach out to us again at labinfo.hariba.com uh, for any questions and feedback. Um, yeah. and make sure you join in our newsletter by answering yes to the post-webinar survey or simply connect with us on LinkedIn. Um, it's called the Particle Characterization Group. For now, have a great day and we'll see you at our next webinar. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.